Welcome back, ladies, gentlemen, um, even all you scoundrels. You can listen to uh, Greg Everett, Ursula Garza. A uh, little late on this one. Ursula has been jet setting around the uh, entire universe again. She just got back from Japan and Mars and who God knows where else. Uh, real quick, head over to healthiq.com slash catalyst. Uh, if you need some life insurance, uh, these guys will get you much better rates as a weightlifter and someone who is consequently healthy um, because they have uh, scientific evidence that that is the case. So they get you better rates from these guys by basically assuring them that you're not going to die so quickly. HealthIQ.com slash catalyst. Ursula, tell us all about what's going on with the IOC and the IWF and all these jerk offs ruining the sport for us. Oh, way to put it like that. Um, So, as everyone has probably read by now, there were some pretty significant changes to um, the IOC program for the Olympics in uh, 2020. And one of the things people don't realize is that we were one of seven sports that lost quotas. So let's start with that. And I don't have my list in front of me. Should should I have it somewhere of all of the sports? And it's sports like um, us and shooting and rowing and track and field. And um, some of them don't make a lot of sense because you're like, well, shooting's not doping probably. But they are. um, Those guys use beta blockers and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, they use beta blockers. But I don't think they have the type, the level of scandals that we have. Um, But. I mean, there may be the case that like every sport is doing something, but um, in any case, it was a decision from what I understand to add 15 new sports. And if you read uh, the IOC um, or Olympics.org, the website, you'll see that two of the words that I think stick out when you when you read it are modernize and to make it more appealing to the youth. Um, and they also refer to the sport as a, like, as a window or to the games as a window to sports. And that's a little bit different, I think, approach than what we've seen in the past where it was a more traditional event that had the traditional sports um, and it was considered the highest level of achievement as opposed to a showcase of sports. And so they're bringing in like surfing and roller sports and a few others. Um, If you go look at the 2020 program, you can see um, what the new sports are that are being added. Um, One or two of them actually didn't even have singular international federations, which is complete anathema to what we've seen in the past, where in order to be accepted into the games, it was generally thought, oh, you had to have a single effective and functioning IF or International Federation with drug testing and you had to be internationally um, pretty well recognized, right? Where you had multiple countries participating in order to even be considered for the Olympic Games program. Well, apparently that's not the case anymore. And what they're really looking at is um, trying to bring in more viewers and they actually have a media station now, and so uh, the you know the desire to appeal to more viewers and to youthful viewers has led them to uh, kind of take a new direction with the entire approach to the Olympic Games. Now, having said all that, weightlifting has a doping problem. That's a given, uh, and one of the uh, reasons that. Uh, they, we were considered as one of the uh, seven sports that lost quotas, and we were second in terms of the number of quotas that we lost. So we lost 64. Track and field lost 105, which is obviously more, but they have more athletes, period. Um, we also went to what was considered gender parity, and that was another thing that if you look at the Olympic, uh, if you go to olympic.org, you'll see them talk about gender equality. And... Um, In our case, instead of upping the class that we asked for to have eight and eight, they put us back down for the women's program to what we had. And actually those those, um, 
weight classes are already set by the IOC as the classes that we had prior to us adding the 90. So the idea that we're going to change those weight classes, um, I mean, it could be done, but there are those weight classes have already been accepted by the IOC. So then the, the job of the IWF becomes to figure out what eight, eight weight classes or what seven weight classes for the men will participate. And I'm just putting that out there for all those people who think that we can rewrite all the classes. Um, so it's just the men's that we're really considering what class, basically uh, what classes will, will compete, uh, which seven. So the, so the to address that part of it, the Olympic program part, because then that goes to, okay, if we have seven and seven, now we have to write, and we only have uh, uh, 98, 98 slots, we have to rewrite now the qualif- qualification process for the Olympic Games, right? You, you're no longer going to have teams of six and four and three and two. It's going to have to change to a degree. So there's a working group that was composed at, by uh, this executive board at the executive board meeting to address that. That's really one issue that we'll have to address based on the reduction of quotas, which is the number of slots that you have at the Olympic Games. The big one, and the one Greg's really referring to, is the fact that the IOC basically came to us with an ultimatum and said, we need, by December 17th, uh, a plan on how you're going to eradicate uh, doping in the sport. And there's two things to look at, because you can eradicate, either try to eradicate positive drug tests, or you can, um, which is something different, right? Because you can yes. always uh, minim- minimize the number of uh positive doping cases by lowering the number of tests that you do. We've actually, as a sport, and everybody knows this in the U.S. because we invest our own money in into testing more, and we test more than any other federation, we end up with more positives. But we try to catch them at the lower levels before they get to international competition because there are penalties, and we consider ourselves an anti-doping country who is very um, aggressive and, and going after um, those who are taking banned substances. At the international level, you have to remember that the way it works is that WADA works with the NADA. So the World Anti-Doping Association works with the National Anti-Doping Association. So they're kind of dependent on the National Adoping, uh, Anti-Doping Association, in our case USADA, to be fair and effective and for there to be no kind of foul play. Well, we all know that in um, Russia, because of the McLaren report, that in fact there was groups of athletes that were being protected and weren't actually being either drug tested or the results were being uh, brought back uh, clean when they weren't. And so, um, you know, they were charged with the systematic drug uh, use. And weightlifting was only one of two federations that actually threw Russia out of the Olympics because of that in in our sport because the IOC left it to each individual sport to decide what they were going to do with Russia. We were one of two that banned them from competing. That's very controversial, of course, but because you basically banned athletes that had never tested positive, but it was shown that their whole country had this system of drug use. Well, um, the president over that at the time was a guy, uh, Sergei Sirtov, who most of us know because he's a great lifter, but um, he was removed. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the candidate that was running against Ion for president had actually named Sirsov as the head of the anti-doping commission for Europe. Um, so that's kind of a funny uh, thing when you think of the accusations that are made against the IWF overall, uh, because this was the other potential candidate for um for, for president of, of the IWF. Anyways, it doesn't matter because he lost. But um, about four years ago, we had gone to, the IWF had gone to WADA and had wanted to have four-year sanctions, and they said, no, that's too much. So the truth is, um, the IWF has, has a really stringent anti-doping policy to throw out countries after you know certain numbers of positives, and right now there are nine countries that are on the bubble, mostly ex-Soviet, but it includes China, um, because of um, this, you know, having so many cases in a short period of time. 
coming from either recent cases or mostly 08 and 12 cases. Well, all of that gets tied up in what's called CAS, the Court of Arbitration of Sports, because um, these countries appeal, of course, because they don't want to get thrown out. So the whole process is a lot more complicated than people think in terms of just throwing a country out because they have a method to be able to appeal and to try to not get thrown out. And of course, countries don't want to get thrown out. Um, I think with this ultimatum, it will become clear to these countries that they have to get thrown out and hopefully they'll sit out their time, clean up, and then come back into the sport clean. Because one thing that we know from this is that it's getting serious now. Like, we've been working in the United States for a long time to try to push for more stringent penalties and uh, penalties that are actually put into effect because it would benefit our athletes who are clean athletes. Um, and I say they are clean athletes, but we too have had uh, positives on international stages, our last being in 2013 uh, at a Pan Ams. And so, um, we, you know, we, we have to be stringent at home because, well, we don't want to be hypocritical. And um, it's really been how we've conducted our, our uh, anti-doping here. But that same cultural change that happened in the 80s and 90s in the, in the United States um, when we went basically from a mostly doping to an anti-doping culture because of the creation of the, of the anti-doping um, program via the USOC, which then later became US, uh, a separate uh, group or agency called USADA, which is recognized by Congress and um, works basically under WADA. Uh, as I as I mentioned, that these NADAs are under WADA, and then they do all the drug testing in those countries. You know, the problem is if we're asking the member federations to clean up. So the IWF doesn't own those member federations, and WADA doesn't own the NADA except for they direct them. And that National Anti-Doping Association is tasked with making sure that um, they conduct the testing for WADA. The problem is some of those um, are not deemed reliable. And there are a number that are, but there are a number that aren't. And so it's going to come down to, um, I think, a few things. And a lot of this has been floating out there in the, you know, interwebs. Um, Sticking to bans once they're imposed. Um, But, of course, we can't intervene with what CAS is doing because that is, as we know, due process in the United States, um, as we know as due process in the United States, so that, the, you know, the appeals process still exists for these countries, um, even if it's multiple cases. And so we're getting this um, pressure from the, the IOC to make sure we, we go in and, and uh, are sincere in, uh, by taking action and creating policies that would be um, I would say punitive, deterrence, and uh, lastly, but probably most importantly, education. I actually had a former Soviet um, Republic representative, uh, I don't want to say, came up to me and asked, which shows some interest at least, um, how do y'all train without it? And I think this is going to become a question. Because you have to remember in a lot of these countries, that's, these systems have been in place for so long and the culture is so entrenched that they really don't even see it as wrong. And that's a problem. First, no, they, now they, 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 they literally laugh at us and wonder, like, yeah. why do you bother? No, yeah. no, I know. I was married to a Belarusian weightlifter um, who w- grew up in the Soviet Union system. Um, and I was basically called not a real weightlifter because I was clean. Yeah, and so, you know, not not even kidding. So I mean, it's going to take. Um, and the thing is, this has been going on for a while in terms of there have been countries getting bans, and there have been athletes, and we've got a lot of lifetimers at this point for for two positives. And you know, I think if if we're going to clean up, we're going to have to stick to our guns. And if we say you're banned, then you're going to be banned. And there's not going to be any workaround or 
uh, a pay to play. I mean, there's still penalties and fines. I think that's appropriate because you hurt the reputation of the sport. But, um, and maybe those need to be higher so that people aren't um, so willing to do it. Well, that's the but, thing is, if you look at a program like a, well, a, a, a you know, a state-funded, supported program, they've got more lifters in the pipeline. When they get bans, there's another one, you know, waiting in line to take that spot. It's not really a big deal. And so mm-hmm. that's that alone, having an athlete banned, obviously right. is not an adequate penalty to dissuade right. these countries from... Uh, you know, not that's legitimately why, drug that's testing. That's why nine countries right now are on the brink of being banned altogether. Yeah. As countries for, and you can only do it for so long. Like you can't. I, I was reading some of the opinions that people have. It's like, well, we got to ban the country for life. Well, I mean, who are we going? Who are we going to compete against? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like us and Great Britain and Canada. I mean, that's that's not pretty really, boring. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be. You know, I don't know. Oh, it wouldn't low. be the Olympics. It wouldn't be the Olympics. And it wouldn't be well, the and, World and the Championship. Ch- I'm not sure with the direction that things are going. Honestly, the Olympics are going to be the Olympics in the way that we have known them in the past. Um, and that's just my opinion. We'll see for sure as time goes on. Uh, I would I would like to um, continue to see. I, I remember in 96, I competed in the World Championships. Of course, the men went to the Olympics. Same thing happened in 92. But I thought, why can't the men have a world championships? Like the world championships is actually more competitive. Right. Um, not to say that, I mean, obviously the Olympics is the Olympics and it's what, you know, people strive for. And I think that's what, you know, the, the real uh, event um, has something special about it that you cannot replace in any way, shape or form. But we all know that even at this point that the Olympics is technically less competitive than a world championships. So um, when you start reducing the quotas significantly, you are left with something that is not really representative or uh, a real duplication of what the world championships is. And that's one of my kind of questions about all of it for just that floats in my little noggin. Um, But the, the IOC has said we have to produce as something for them and one of you know part of which we have to do is go and um elucidate what we're already doing because they really didn't ask um so they don't know the newer anti-doping policies that have come out more recently i believe it was in april uh, okay. with the new anti-doping and and beyond that i think we have to um show all that we've done the truth is the the 08 and the 12 doping didn't really like those retests didn't come under our directive but all of the testing that's happening now like you know the in, inordinate number of positives that we had at the worlds in uh 2015 in houston and um all of that did come under our banner and so we um I have to try to, I think we really have to try to push these member federations to understand that it's a collective survival issue. If they continue doping, they're bringing down the whole ship. Right. Um, and, 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 and that the sport would be, you know, can potentially be eradicated as a, an Olympic sport. And that that's not just um, a, 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 you know, levy threat. It's a real threat. I think most of us have seen that for a couple of Olympiads where we've said, this is not looking good, guys. This is not looking good. But I think the addition of this idea that they're going to have 28 sports on the agenda every time and you could or could not be one is, you know, they're not increasing the number of sports. They're going with a set number of sports. And as of now, we are, are in the 20 and 2024 20, games with the caveat that we produce by the 17th, uh, something that convinces them that we're really on a, a, a anti-doping path. And it's hard to know if anything will convince them or if we need to produce, just let them know that we are working fervently to correct, you know, and try to push all of our countries to try to clean up. The other, and the other thing that you have to realize is if we say, well, we're gonna test more we'll probably end up with more positive still for some period of time until it finally cleans out. Right. Um, that's what we saw in the U S where there were a lot, there were more positives for a while. And now that we have more people coming in, 
um, we're getting I'm like right now I feel like we're seeing more positives in the US than ever before but they're third yeah, and fair. second tier they're, yeah. but we're testing more there are more people involved and it's mostly second and, and, and third tier level lifters but we are catching top tier lifters too every once in a while and it kind of boggles the mind because you're like well these people we've been blatantly clear that we're going to test you and what we're going to test you for so um, it is it's baffling just, <laughs> Like, it's massive. Yeah. How do you expect this to? I mean, honestly, uh, because it is second and third tier primarily, and kind of what you might call dilettante lifters. You know, they're coming in briefly from other sports, kind of dip a toe in the water and then pull out. I think they're I just get, roll. They're just rolling the dice. E- either yeah. they they don't because they're new to it and they haven't been around. They really don't know what the drug testing situation is. They don't know that it happens. But I think at least a big part of it is that. Well, you know, there are 400 people at this meet. What are the odds of uh, me getting tested when I place 18th or, you know, right. whatever the case well, is? People don't realize that we test B and C sessions and lower mm-hmm. sessions get test get tested. Too. Yeah. So knock it off. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Could you make it up? The, you know, the U.S. look like we have a problem, too. Um, and, you know, the truth is the sport has a problem. I think I preface this whole thing. Uh, with that, so the I, uh, the IWF has has created not just a working group for for the program for like you know the qualifying process and how to deal with the 64 quota um, deletion, but also uh, a, a working group to put together, which is composed of uh, doctors and lawyers and people of of learned stature. Um, to this put is a house a, of learned doctors. <laughs> <laughs> to. Um, to, to put together what we have and what we're uh, we'll do, we'll have another meeting, another executive board meeting in Romania um, coming up soon, and um, we'll have to you know like look at whatever they've composed at that point and be prepared for uh, for that for December. And of course, we have Worlds in November as well, so I'm sure we'll that'll be kind of the f- final. I mean, the way things work, just FYI, people. Is that you know nobody sits down in a meeting really and comes up with a solution in one hour or two hours or three hours like usually that's a the, the last meeting is a is a finalizing of a document and I'm saying that because there were some accusations thrown around that the the results of the election made this happen like this is why they're coming down on us when the fact is. Um, They've had, they've had, the IOC has had a working group deciding which sports we're going to stay in and what. And our doping problems didn't just happen between June 1st and June 9th. Our doping problems have been, you know, long standing. Um, and I think um, we did get looked at more severely because of that and how it taints the, the whole uh, image of, of the Olympic Games, even though we're not the only sport with scandals. And of course, I think it's no surprise in that track and field were, was the sport that lost the most quotas um, because they've had similar issues and they have similar issues um, uh, to to weightliftings and so in any case um, they, they had the IOC had had a working group to, to kind of decide which sports were going to stay in and out and um, that the that report was delivered and finalized by by their working group on June 9th they didn't just sit around waiting for the IWF election to happen and then say, okay, you know, we, that's not the people we wanted, so this is what we're going to do. It was, um, you know, a series of meetings and a decision um, because, again, these decisions aren't hastily made. Uh, time is always provided to come up with, with a plan. Um, and, and we, I think, have always known that um, we're a little bit in peril because of our situation. And the 08 and the 12 retest, of course, certainly uh, shone a light uh, into the sport in a very negative manner. Yeah, and, and that was a punch in the nads for sure. Yeah, and that's a real, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a true, you know, it's not like it's, a, it's a, some kind of falsehood. It's a reflection of what has been going on. And to think that the IWF alone can solve this problem, it really is going to re- require the cooperation of member federations, cultural change, education, true deterrence and punishment, 
And there's a whole variety of, of areas that will need to be addressed if we're really going to clean up the sport. And I think that we are at the point that everyone recognizes there is no choice. And, you know, so we're sitting at a, you know, in the EB meeting and there's, you know, new representation from the Soviet republics because the old representation has been ousted. Um, not only because of uh, the, the the country's status and po- uh, the number of positives, but because everyone knows that those people aren't going to be, or, or believes at least, that those people aren't going to clean up the sport if they were the people that were running it when it wasn't clean. And so I, I have some real kind of uh, hope that with um, new representation from these countries, that they're going to go back and carry the message and say, hey, you're going to have to figure out how to do this clean. Um, and if you want to know how, maybe ask the Americans. They've been doing it for a long time. They're actually starting to win medals. Go ask uh, Ray. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or, or Kevin, who's got, you know, you know his first lifter was a superstar. Um, and he's, a, you know, a badass CrossFit athlete. So he probably knows something about coaching, right? Um, but in any case, I know he does. Uh, he actually listens to us. He told me he did. He was just so, being nice. Yes. No, he wasn't. He was actually talking about substance that I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on from the uh, incredibly depressing and frustrating uh, side I'm of things. I'm sorry. And... 37 minutes of bad news. Well, it's not you bad know. news. You know, actually, for me, and I know that everybody's like, oh, my God, this is, we're going to get kicked out of the Olympics. I mean, that's uh, a scary prospect. It sure is. But if it means right now that we're at a tipping point – that the rest of the world will actually clean up. We won't see the numbers that we used to see potentially, or maybe we will um, eventually. I mean, we have some freak athletes. Let's just be real. Um, But at least that sense that you have at nationals that you're competing on an even playing field, which makes it a whole lot less frustrating to compete, will get carried over to the international stage. And I remember my first Worlds, um, and I was standing, you know, after the competition was over and I was looking around at my competition and I was like, well, I'm the number one girl. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, the, I felt like I was the most feminine in the group. And so, you know, that sense of God, this is so not fair. And it was so frustrating. I remember walking out of a competition one time because I just couldn't take it anymore. Because it, it was just so obvious. The drug use was so obvious amongst the women because obviously you can more easily tell. Yeah. And so and that, that level of frustration that our athletes have been subjected to has just never been fair. And so I, you know, I'm hopeful for our athletes that you know, they'll be, have a chance to know what it's like Um to compete on an even playing field. You know, I posted something on Instagram the other day, something about like, um, we plant the seeds that grow the shade uh, up under which we'll never sit. And that's true. So I'm hoping this is planting the seeds that will grow the tree under which obviously you and I are too damn old to even sit or lift. Um, <laughs> but you know, later down the road, there will be this, you know, clean playing field for athletes internationally and our, you know, American and other uh, countries that have very like Germany that has very I mean Germany you go to fucking jail for for, for drugs for using steroids so um, you know other countries that have taken this very seriously and have cleaned up um, that they'll have a chance to be back um, competing you know just competing being able to compete on a fair playing field yeah, so it, would be, it would be fantastic to, in addition to the, the fair playing field for the athletes individual or individually, it'd be nice to dispel this pervasive myth of foreign superiority of knowledge in all things weightlifting. Right. Uh, it, it would be nice to actually see what the competition is like without the benefit of drugs on right. one side of things, uh, because that really gets misrepresented uh, as, you know, superior programming or superior technique, which, I mean, if you really look into it, it's not there. There, yeah, there aren't no, any yeah, big right. secrets that, you know, well, we the secret Canada is, is or Great Britain yeah. 
uh, you know, are not doing, and that's why we're terrible. And so that'll be nice. Well, it, it's, I mean, this certainly, the whole blow up, it seems to shut some people up who have always been like, America sucks and their coaches suck and they should have Oh, uh, no, and, the, those, yeah. they, that won't shut them up. They'll find some other <laughs> fucking stupid. Uh, well, I've actually got reasoning. some people that like, they should just. They should just let drugs, you know, they should just let everyone use drugs. And it's like, well, first of all, it's it's not, you know, people die prematurely and have heart attacks and shit because of drug use. Like, it, there are side effects, you know. Well, and especially uh, if there's women participating in the sport, that's uh, an even shittier situation. Yeah. It's, an, it's, it's one thing for a, for a male athlete to take certain health risks with steroids. It's an entirely different ball game for a female to do it because... You, you just have a whole entirely new set of problems on top of the other ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Um, let's, just, uh, let's just all just have robot sports. That's where it's all... <laughs> we have drone racing already. Like, why do we even have human beings doing anything? Don't even mention that. That's what's going to end up being on the agenda now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if if drone racing makes it into the Olympics and uh, speed walking and rhythmic gymnastics are still in, but weightlifting and wrestling are out, I, I'm I don't I'm just gonna give up on pretty much my entire life <laughs> because it's meaningless. Well, at that I mean, point. first thing that'll go is this podcast. Just to let everybody know. Oh yeah, no the pod Such the podcast is uh, is is teetering on the edge of a cliff. Well, you could use On the podcast heels every, every regularly, <laughs> bitch, about that. Oh, boy. Okay, well, before we you're lose only, any more of our five only. people that listen, let's get on to helping some people with weightlifting stuff instead of just telling them what a horrible situation we're in. Uh, okay. I, my, I would uh, venture a guess that very few of the people listening to this show are, are scheduled listening? to participate in the 2020 Olympics. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> yeah, that too. But I always assume that. All right. Dan asks, hi, what would your top three accessory exercises for overhead? Oh, what would be your top three extra uh, accessory? <laughs> I can't even read. I've been listening to you talk for so long. I forgot how to read. Uh, for overhead stability. Me. <laughs> Massive All thanks for the home. awesome info you guys are putting out. Cheers. Uh, oh, he's- He's from Great Britain. Cheers. Well, yeah, or or some more recent uh, British colony. Uh, yeah, I would I would want to kind of maybe split this into snatch and jerk because I just feel too oppressed uh, limiting it to three total. So let's oh, do that. Well, I did it as asked. Okay. Well, let's hear them. You said you did it. Let's go. What are you waiting for? I did it. I'm. I'm. Are you waiting for us to read what you wrote down? It's a. It's a pregnant pause to create anticipation. (laughs) Um, Snatch balance, jerk recovery, and squat jerk. (laughs) That was my mic drop, but it was really a pen. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's just let's just stop this whole thing because you've just said it all. Uh, Yeah, I'm all for snatch balances for the snatch. I would add overhead squats, and we've talked about this at length in previous episodes. Um, I was just following directions. I didn't elaborate. Okay. You know, editing well, is a real... I'm just fucking with let's, let's all just take a deep breath, and uh, <clears throat> instead of following exactly what we think the question is asking, let's just help everyone as well as we possibly okay. can. You don't get extra points. You're not getting paid to be precise <laughs> in interpreting the question. Exactly. So <laughs> let's 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 uh, get gratification out of uh, Dude, the idea of want. helping someone. Yeah, that too. <laughs> so snatch balance. Yeah, uh, overhead squat would be as we've talked about, kind of the more uh, basic or you know general snatch receiving position. Uh, stability, strength, mobility exercise, and over time we would theoretically, uh, you know, transition into relying more on snatch balance variations than overhead squat as an athlete progresses. Uh, but as we kind of argued about previously, I would still say that the overhead squat for a lot of lifters who are fairly advanced, it still has some utility and can be really useful. And in fact, uh, it can 
be more useful in certain in, uh, circumstances than a snatch balance can. Uh, overhead squat offers you a ton of different options for variations. You can do pauses in the bottom. You can do tempos on the way down. You can do tempos on the way up, although that's um, a, a little less common. Um, snatch balance, you can do the same thing. You can do complexes like snatch balance plus overhead squat or you know snatch push press plus snatch balance, whatever the case is. Snatch plus snatch balance, snatch plus overhead squat, all these different things. Um, so yeah, those two would be big, but then I, I would add to that for the snatch specifically, uh, snatch push presses. I think that's kind of an underused exercise or an underappreciated exercise. Maybe it's, it's kind of done. Oh, we use the shit out of it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's done kind of almost <laughs> like, uh, routinely uh, without a lot of thought put into it, which I think greatly limits its effectiveness. You see people you know, driving the bar up and the moment their arms use extension, they're relaxing again and bringing that bar back down, which makes me fucking nuts. I can't yeah. stand it. It's it's like watching people do push-ups where they don't straighten their arms and they just flop on the ground and like hump it <clears throat> creepily the whole time. So lock well, the thing out and hold it for a second. This shit is not for time. This is for it's for substance. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do. I yell at people constantly about snatch push presses and push presses. I end up having to write in their programs, hold each rep overhead for one second. Right. And then sometimes right. there's a parenthetical after that is, oh, I'm going to fucking kill you. Yeah. Um, you got to get their attention somehow because most of them don't read. So snatch push press uh, plus overhead squat, I think, is a great complex. We use that a ton. Uh, for our yeah. lifters, and I'm, uh, it sounds like yeah. you do too. But that's yeah. a great one to to kind of we get. use that and and then snatch pounds overhead squat. Like we we throw, I, I, we do overhead squat as part of the the programming for sure. And I for yeah, lots of reasons. well, I think it's important to to understand that more, spending more time in the overhead position is in and of itself a very good exercise. And so that that includes you know if you're really shitty in the bottom of your snatches holding all your snatches for three to five seconds in the bottom, mm -hmm. holding your overhead squats, holding your snatch balances, holding your snatch push presses, you know, in that locked out position, because you'll see so many people rushing out of those positions because they're not stable in them. Right. And right. then wondering like stay. it's some big fucking mystery why their stability doesn't improve, uh, you know, when they do that for years on end. So spend some time down there. It's a great diagnostic too. It's going to show you if you're out of balance, how you're out of balance, uh, you know, whether or not you you're actually maintaining tension. You yeah. You, you learn that control and the stability, which is the whole point. So if, if you can't hold a snatch in the bottom position for three seconds, things are going terribly wrong. You've, you've got to fix something. Um, I've even used those that particular movement just to get them to um, to not rush out, you know, not to rush out of the bottom, you know, it, where they where they lift their butt and right. their chest dives forward as they're standing up, like learning how to recover with your chest up. Yep. Anyways, I I digress. Go ahead. No, that's a good point, and that's uh, that's that mm -hmm. comes back to one of the um, you know using tempos with an overhead squat or the recovery of a snatch balance and and forcing people to not just bounce their butts way up and end up in a low bar overhead squat all of a sudden and mm -hmm. wonder why their shoulders hurt and they keep dropping bars. Uh, for jerk, jerk recoveries, definitely. Uh, those are surprisingly difficult for people, especially when they don't do them regularly. Uh, they, they feel pretty good about themselves until you put them in a power rack with a jerk recovery and you, you look over and they've got the pin set super high so they're split, you know, their feet are about eight <laughs> inches apart and, you know, the knees are only bent about, uh, you know, 10 degrees. And you say, well, oh, that's that's where you receive all your jerks? Uh, no, but lower is harder. Yeah, well, no shit. Let's how about we prepare you for the position you're actually going to receive your jerks in, you know, the one where you struggle. Uh, so make sure you when you do jerk recoveries, Get in your actual jerk split position, like the one you're going to be in, in your your heaviest jerks. And if you have to start really light, that's fine. It's it's better for you to do jerk recoveries with 50 kilos from a proper position than do 100 kilos from a position you're not going to have any trouble with. Uh, push presses, I like, but again, like snatch push presses, lock it out all the way. Don't be lazy. Don't act like someone's forcing you to do this and you hate every second of it and you just want to get through it as quickly as possible and go home and watch Netflix or whatever the fuck people do. Uh, 
And then the last one I would say for jerk is jerk from split. So starting in the full split position, dipping and driving, and then receiving in that same split position, but both feet come off the ground and then land again. I think that's a, a really good one. Oh my God. I left, I had one of them. The complex that my, my guys did yesterday was a jerk plus that, which we call a jerk bounce, but the jerk from the split position and then another jerk. Ugh. Right. And one of my guys was capital Crying. R. Oh my God. <laughs> he was not figuring it out. And it's just because he's so stiff. Like yeah. he couldn't bend his both knees to create the drive for the jerk in catching in the jerk position. And so like the jerk from the jerk position. So he was, it was a disaster. I almost <laughs> wanted to abandon shit, but I just made him, I mean, I literally was there with him. I had to get up out of my chair. <laughs> Ugh, son of a I bitch. Was, I, oh my God. And I was doing, um, uh, split, like lunge, uh, lunges, not lunges, one-legged squats, like, and then scissoring in the air and landing on the other foot and doing a, you know, a one-legged squat and then switching. So like a, what do they call them? Lunges that split, we call them, um, split jumps. Yeah. Right. So we were doing those. So you'd land in the jerk position, then you would jump and then land in the jerk position with the other foot forward and then jump. And then do, I, we were literally doing that. He couldn't do that. I mean, this is like one of the most athletic guys in terms of his strength <clears throat> and the, the coordination, it was just like, and then he's like, Oh my, my knee that I, you know, had surgery on. I'm like, Oh, shut up. You're like squatting a house already. Your, your knee is fine. And yeah, that's why you have another <laughs> was, one. <laughs> well, no, I mean, he's, we, we, we rehab the names. It was, it's a, hard, a lot harder than people realize for a whole bunch of reasons. Like the coordination it takes to do that is apparently pretty <laughs> It is. It's it's tough, and it's it's a pretty um, it's pretty humbling exercise if you don't do it regularly. But that one kind of puts not just the overhead stability, but that lower body, you know, split position stability, which can be a big part of the problem for the jerk. Is you have people bouncing around all over the place; they can't get into a solid, stable position in their lower body. So it's not a big surprise that the mm -hmm. upper body suffers and you, you kind of see that stability manifested there. Well, and he is so strong in his upper body that it was really the lower body stability that we were seeing the issue in. Like he was wanting to cross his feet and he didn't, he's, he's one of those jerkers that always catches too much on his front leg because he won't bend his back knee. <laughs> and, then it's, and then he's like my hip and it's, you know, when we try to make him sit upright because um, his hip's tight. And so we're like, well then bend your fucking knee. That'll alleviate the tightness in the hip. And it was almost like we were reteaching this guy who can literally jerk over 180 kilos um, how to how to catch a jerk. So yeah, I guess always there, that's always a really bizarre experience. Like, how did you get this far in life? He's just strong as shit. Yeah. And so, um, but for injury prevention, it becomes important. And well, so, yeah, you know, the weights that I was giving you're jerking 180 plus and you can't stabilize it, you're just asking yeah. for trouble. Yeah, yeah. And so these made their so... I'm coming up with different um, combos for them to, to, based on the problems of the hole. And that was one of them. And boy, did I get a treat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they really appreciated it. The one last thing. Well, Derek, I well, Derek did fine. I saw his videos. He looked good. Well, yeah. He wasn't struggling. Some people can figure it out. No problem. Oh, he, he's, yeah. He's more athletic, maybe. The, the last exercise I would add just for general over, overhead stability is um, either walking or lunging one arm dumbbell overhead carries. Uh, and you'll see a yeah. lot of disparity side to side on these for people and people don't know how to um, you know lock in that shoulder blade to create a stable base, which is really important. Um, so that that can be done you know at the end of a workout. It's easy, it's really simple. Uh, but that can really get people kind of in touch with what exactly their shoulders and arms are doing uh, and get rid of a lot of laziness that you get when you have a barbell kind of allowing your arms to support each other so they don't have to, to uh, work as hard. That's one of the exercises I give uh, in the warm-up yeah. if I have post-injury, like if we have some shoulder elbow injury to try to restabilize the shoulder and get it strong overhead. And work all the, you know, I mean, the back end is complex, 
And so trying to tell people to contract certain muscles is really difficult, but you get them to stabilize a dumbbell in the, in the position of a jerk overhead, that by itself is hard to do just standing. Well, to keep moving while you're doing it is really difficult. Yeah. If you don't have either the mobility or the stability. Indeed. So use it for both. That's a good one. I had squat jerk on there. We do power jerk into overhead squat until everyone can squat jerk. And nobody squat jerks in competition. We just do it for um, really the, the mid and upper back so that yeah. they learn how to hold an upright position, which is one of the questions down the road. Yeah. But to make yeah. sure everybody has that mid back strength to keep their chest up, uh, particularly like on the clean or in the snatch. Um, we do uh, power jerk or uh, push press plus overhead squat until we get to the point that they can actually squat jerk, and then we'll, I'll give them that as well. And, you know, one of the things about exercises like squat jerk and like clean jerks, um, that, which is a clean without a pause between the clean and jerk, um, is that they're, uh, they're a little bit low, lower in intensity because, by virtue of the movement itself, and they, they have some benefits to the coordination of the athlete uh, and in the clean jerk, like the speed of the feet and things like that, and the speed of the lock, um, but also how they recover out of the clean because it makes you very cognizant, just like pausing in the bottom of the snatch makes you real cognizant of how you're catching. They're fun. Like they are you know, every once in a while you have every once in a while you have to throw in something that is you know not traditional and uh, f- more entertaining, and then you know they're now they're competing with each other at like. 70 to 80 percent of their max but they're still competing with each other yeah that that novelty is really important it's pretty monotonous training otherwise but it has to be novelty Mm -hmm. with a purpose besides novelty right 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 yeah 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 yeah. you just don't do you know a whole you know month of novelty shit well yeah you don't like like ride around juggling on a unicycle just because it's different (laughs) this is gonna help my weightlifting i'm sure (laughs) i'm so coordinated now for the split jerk Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how this name is pronounced. Qatar or Qatar or Kautar. I don't know. I apologize. Probably, probably none of the above is what Pro- I'm guessing. It, most likely. But uh, I like his little note at the end here. Uh, I have a question regarding the lockout in the receiving position, especially for the snatch and the jerk. I miss my lifts when it gets heavy because I'm unable to lock out the bar soon enough. So I lose the bar. Most of the time, it's not in front of me or behind me, but on me directly, and the bar uh, path is usually good. It's not even a matter of mobility, but more neurological, like the reflex of securing the bar quickly. I'm pretty sure I can add at least 10 uh, kilograms to my jerk and my snatch because my hips are fast and the bar arrives quickly and is pretty high, but I'm not prepared to receive it, so I'm always a few seconds late. And this is how I miss all my lifts. It's the same problem for the clean, so the bar crashes on me, and then my jerk is a nightmare because I need twice more energy to recover from the clean. Uh, I have this problem. Oh, yeah, you light- laughed at him for needing twice as much energy. That's sweet. No, I wasn't actually <laughs> laughing at him. That's a, a, a pretty a rude assumption, though. Uh, I have this problem with light and heavy <laughs> <Whatever>. weights. <laughs> the difference <laughs> being, with light weights, I can still hold onto the bar even if I don't secure a good lockout right away, so I get away with it. But it also means that it's definitely not a strength or mobility issue. I hope my question will be answered. Sorry if the English is not very good. Thanks. I'm laughing because as I read this, his English is pretty fucking good. It's clearly yeah, not his first language. Known. I wouldn't have And known. it makes me laugh in a very kind of uh, depressed sort of way to know that English is a second language. He has a better mastery of it than most <laughs> native <laughs> English speakers in the fucking country. Which is so, something to be said because Greg's degree is actually isn't it in, in being English a dick. or in literature? <laughs> yeah, well, that's your that's your PhD. What's your yeah. what was your undergrad in? Being an asshole. Yeah, yeah well, no, it's between, English, but it was only yeah, English was, because I that was the easiest way to get a college degree. It's really not, Greg. There's well, it was for me. What am I going to be a, a fucking <laughs> math major? Yeah, no, no. Communications, exactly. um, no offense Liberal communications studies. people, but you know what you're doing. Uh, women's studies. Yeah, all, um, I, all, all I had to do was say, read books and make shit up about them. Did you, what, did you say political studies? Because I'm going to punch you in the nose. No, I said liberal studies. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. to be a well, kindergarten well, teacher or something. Like education, those are all much easier. Trust me, I went through the range because I was just trying to get the fuck out of my undergrad. I ended up doing exercise in sports science. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a lame one, too. Shut up. <laughs> What's my VO2 max? 
Yeah, until uh, biomechanics eat your fucking lunch. Shit. You're like, is uh, this about weightlifting? Because if it's about not about weightlifting, I don't really care. That was my problem. Yeah, the number of times in my career I've had to explain how the Krebs cycle work is exactly zero. Fuck. Except for that one test. (laughs) Yeah, give me a fucking break. Okay. Uh, Sorry, we were getting pretty far afield now and giving people like career and education advice. And basically, what it came down to was don't bother going to school and don't get a job and just don't do anything. Uh, this I, yeah, I like this question though because I, I see this a lot and it's a super frustrating mm-hmm. problem for people um, yeah. because they'll especially in the jerk you know they'll drive the shit out of the bar it's obviously high enough they're obviously low enough but you know their arms all of a sudden look like a pair of you know rubber pistons when when the weight comes down on them and so they course, can't time the lock with the, the just like he's talking about the bar crashing that's what it all is it's a bar yep. crashing yeah, well, and it's, it's, it's that lack of connection throughout the entire mm-hmm. movement, which makes that timing basically impossible. And the fact that he says he has the same problem with the snatch and the clean uh, makes me think that, it, because this is really common, <clears throat> that he is so overly focused on elevating the bar, you know, exploding upward, driving upward, that the moment that's finished, everything else just kind of shuts down. You know, like it's just get the bar up there He's and then just cross your fingers and hope you don't die as it, you know, returns to earth. Uh, and because it, it, I do see that all the time and it, it makes me crazy. You know, the, the lift has to be active from start to finish. So the moment you decide to drop the bar from that overhead position, you have to be doing something actively. You're not waiting for the bar to come back to you. You're not waiting to fall down to the ground and do a squat. You're not waiting for whatever to just take care of itself. Um, So maybe we should kind of the whole idea is to wedge yourself between the bar and the ground with locked arms. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah. Let's let's talk about the jerk specifically first. Cause I I think that's probably where this happens more often. Um, but yeah, continue that thought because I, I think that is missed by a lot of people that they just throw the bar in the air and then kind of get into a split and then wait for something to, else to happen. So we're going to probably be looking at like up and down movements where you throw the bar up, you come down without moving. So you're probably the jerk in a jerk, right? Is that what you're going to come up with? Uh, jerk from split yeah yeah although i'll tell you what uh, one that might be better as kind of a remedial thing i call it jerk. push press behind the neck in split the split right yeah. so it's you, yeah, that's your feet stay planted on the ground and so you, you're maintaining constant tension pushing against the ground and or pushing against the bar and so that kind of teaches you that timing and that that maintenance of of tension and connection and then you can start you know transitioning to say like a, a jerk from split uh, or, you know, push press plus power jerk, you know, whatever. So anyway, sorry, keep going. No, but I teach the jerk actually in that progression with like putting them in the split position, one to keep, get them comfortable in the split position, but then with a, a, just a regular press in the jerk and then a push press in the jerk and then the jerk balance or the jerk in split position. Like I use that regularly as I teach them for this reason. Yep. Because otherwise, bars are coming down on you, and that is never good if they're in the right bar path. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Maximum so, damage. Um, for that, so then if we take that and apply it to the clean and jerk, we'd end up with a, a snatch strict press, a snatch push press, and then a snatch balance, but maybe first a snatch balance catching it at a quarter squat and then a half squat and then a full squat and being able to move up and down in that range so that you're adjusting and finding the bar and locking under it every single time. Yeah. And and I would add to that a snatch recovery where you have the bar on blocks and you're, I had a guy that this would happen to regularly, really long arms, really big biceps. So I, I think almost there would be a stretch reflex in his bicep where as soon as he went to lock his elbow, it would recoil. Yeah. Um, and then he had had some, uh, uh, had to have shoulder surgery because he hurt himself holding onto a bar in a competition. And he what an idiot! I would never do down, that. You know, nobody would um, <laughs> save a lift. What? No, um, he 
he still had that same problem from before. So I said, this is our chance to really work on it while we're strengthening your shoulder. And we started doing this uh, snatch recoveries where you put the bar uh, elevated on the block so that you're in the bottom of the squat position. And then you push up because it teaches you how to, um, instead of, because he couldn't do snatch balance without that elbow bending. Yeah. And so we were doing those to teach him how to create tension through the upper back shoulder and elbow on the bar as he stood up. So, so that well, was yeah, along difference. the similar lines, um, I would do something like start off with a pressing snatch balance. So, you know, you're in your squat position, bar on the back of your neck, snatch grip, yeah, yeah. and you're, you're pressing down slowly. It's a nice controlled mm-hmm. movement. And then basically trying to time the lockout of the arms with, you know, hitting the bottom of the squat. And then you transition to a drop snatch. So, which is what I call a snatch balance with no dip and drive. Yeah. Uh, I believe that's the Lynn Jones terminology from years ago in USA weightlifting. Uh, and then going to, is it his fault? I'm pretty sure he's the one who had the, the pressing the snatch balance, change. drop snatch, heaving mm-hmm. snatch balance, snatch balance. Yeah. So well, I take, you know, I take no responsibility those, for those. Yeah, all of those are <laughs> like, like that. Um, all of those are good. Uh, yeah. And you could do combinations of it, like a pressing snatch balance plus a heaving snatch balance, and then go to a snatch balance, or like you said, a drop snatch without a dip and drive. Like well, all of those, and, and doing those kinds of combinations sh- should, it, in time, Qatar, teach you, and I hate to call you uncoordinated, but teach you the coordination of finding and meeting, and the timing of finding and meeting the bar. Because that's yeah. what you're really working on. Well, so I, I would start with the pressing, go to a drop snatch just because it's simple. You don't have the dip and drive timing to worry about. Then come out to like a tall snatch. So now you're you're actually working on that active pull under the bar and then finishing with the punch up that you just practiced with the drop snatch. Then moving down to say like a snatch from power position or a hip snatch. So really, really high hang. So you're getting just the tail end of that second pull the transition at the top, the pull under, and then that punch, and then start moving to maybe, you know, hang at the knee or slightly below knee and then to the floor. And that way you're kind of, you're piecing together each little section, uh, you know, once you've figured out the timing on those and then turning it into that one continuous motion. Cause right now it, it is, it does sound like it's kind of a, a little bit piecemeal where it's this, he's blasting the thing up into the, into the stratosphere and then everything's just falling down like the pieces of the clock that explodes in the uh, cartoon. Did you ever hear Zygmunt's little comment? I won't mention the lifter that he used to call this, that he would say that his, his arms were like wet noodles. <laughs> no, <remember> that? <laughs> no, I did not I, hear that. I think one. that's the syndrome. And that was a, a nationally borderline internationally competitive lifter and he was like his arms are like wet noodles yeah and something else to note here which so so you're not alone yeah like some people just have this issue so he he's already figured out the problem is not strength or mobility it's timing and a pretty simple way to figure that out is you know if you can overhead squat more weight than you can snatch for example but all your snatches are pressed out or rebounding like that, it's obviously not a strength problem. You're strong enough to hold the bar in a locked out position. Uh, you know, if you can sit into an overhead squat, you know, all the way to the bottom in a balanced, strong position with, you know, snatch weight plus, it's not mobility. So that pretty much just leaves timing, uh, especially if the bar, like he says, is directly overhead. It's in the proper position. You know, it's not like it's forward, in which case it's it's going to be pretty likely that you're not going to be able to lock out your elbows because you can't get your upper back into it. Um, I, I, the clean I would be the exact same thing. I would probably start the same way, you know, working with front squats and then like a tall clean and then a clean from, you know, mid thigh or something like that. And just kind of gradually. Muscle, muscle cleans are good for crashing. Yeah. Mus- you know what? I think. I love muscle cleans, but hardly anyone uses them and when they do they are so bad that mm-hmm. i think they end up being counterproductive so you really have to we do, just them, do them we just do them from um the upper thigh mostly we don't like doing them from the ground for my people it just seems to elude them um <laughs> but well, I yeah it, it looks like a really, bent really row well. and then they stand yeah. up with it <laughs> we, we usually do them to learn to get their elbows really really fast but it can right. also help with the with the 
basic well, timing. Well, it, it helps getting the elbows fast, but it helps to actually learn where what to do with the arms, you know, to bring that bar to the shoulders before you turn over mm-hmm. and stay connected to it. So, yeah, that's a big... Even if you launch the bar up in the air, you should be connected to it during that turnover, and so you can't get too far away from it. Yeah. Uh, did we cover what we needed to cover on that one? I have this feeling that we're leaving something out. Oh, well. Well, there's always the next episode. There's <laughs> there's always the next episode and or just leaving people again, unsatisfied. Guitar, maybe. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. All right, guys. Uh, I realize I haven't been reminding people where to post questions because we get emails like, I don't know where to send you my question. So here's my question in this email. Uh, go to catalystathletics.com slash podcast. And there's a link there to submit your question directly to me so I can sort through all these things and get good ones uh, to keep doing this show until we get down to the last listener, in which case it's just going to be a private conversation. Uh, We'll be back to where we started, in the car, (laughs) driving to a clinic. Exactly, wondering why we ever decided to do this. Uh, We're on episode 25, isn't that some sort of a landmark? Of sorts. Uh, no, but okay. Oh, <laughs> and anything over one, down. I think, just, is a landmark for us. Let's I'll just take a shot, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have a moment, go uh, leave a review, leave a rating on iTunes or Google Play or whatever you listen to this on. And uh, if you have questions about this specific podcast, you can find the episode at catalystathletics.com slash podcast and post it in the, the uh, comments there. And, and uh, I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. All right, guys, Ursula needs to go back to sleep. She's probably jet lagged. I'm jet lagged as shit. Yeah. This is my sixth more than 12 hour time change this month. Oh, that's perfectly healthy. Don't worry about it. Shit. I'm getting fat. Like, traveling made me fat. Yeah, it's terrible for out. you. That's why I yeah, don't do it. Yeah, it's the worst. Yeah, shut up. I travel from my bedroom to my office to my garage, and that's about it. That's like a perfect life. How do I get there? Oh, I go visit Greg. That's yeah. how. <laughs> you, I'm you, you, uh, you talented I'm Mr. Ripley me. You just pretend uh, to be me and kill me and bury me in the, the yard somewhere. <laughs> It's not I'm that just, hard. You've you've I'm you've listened sure to me enough. I'm sure someone would notice. Yeah, just just have if a I really did. short fuse and get angry about really trivial shit all the time, and people will never I'm notice just, the difference. Uh, done. Okay. So there. All right, guys. Thank you for listening. If you still are, we appreciate it. Talk to you <laughs> next time. All right. Bye.